Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning. So my name is Sama Bilbao Leon. I'm Director General of World Nuclear Association, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special session in which we are going to launch a brand new report, the Global Playbook for Nuclear Energy Development in Embarking Countries, Six Dimensions for Success. So as you know, this is a collaborative effort between the Clean Air Task Force, the EFI Foundation, and the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So, you know, let me just do a little bit of uh, framing of why this is very important. So here we are at COP28, and what our first priority, of course, is to decarbonize to, and to do this as quickly as possible by, by 2050. But while we are doing that, we cannot do this leaving anybody behind. So we really need to remember that there are uh, 800 million people all over the world that still do not have a reliable access to any kind of energy. So we truly believe that for them, the energy transition is one that goes from no energy to energy. So that is a completely different transition. This means, of course, that uh, nuclear energy could be one of the key uh, energy sources that can help those countries actually uh, leapfrog from where they are currently to a future in which they have abundant, affordable, 24-7 clean energy. So this is what we are doing with, with this report. So many of you know that the International Atomic Energy Agency has done for, for probably a couple of decades a very good job uh, setting up the foundation uh, for solid and robust infrastructure in newcomer countries. And if you are familiar with the milestones reports, they actually look at 19 dimensions that newcomer countries need to consider as they are pursuing or trying to pursue a, a nuclear, a civilian nuclear program. But now we have this report. This report is meant to be the next evolution in engaging embarking countries and really equipping them with the best information and capabilities available in order to accelerate this journey and actually make it, make it successful. So the report, uh, instead of going through the 19 uh, dimensions that we had in the IA reports, is much more, much more pragmatic, and it actually focused in six key topics. And I will not tell you what they are, because I know that Armand will go in much more detail about that. But, uh, but it, as I say, it's really very pragmatic, and it's really uh, expected to help these countries to actually move forward very quickly. And let me just, just uh, leave uh, leave you with a thought. You know, we are here in the United Arab Emirates who made a political decision to pursue a nuclear civilian program in 2008. And they broke ground in the first unit in 2011. So I just want you to look at the time progression here. And then they started operating the first unit in 2020. So essentially, uh, you know, the U United Arab Emirates is really a poster child of vision on leadership and really effective and pragmatic uh, project management. And certainly, I'm pretty sure that if you look at some of the guidelines that we are going to see in this report are some of the guidelines that the UAE follow. Uh, and, and we are hoping that, that, that other countries could, could do the same. So uh, I think that many of you were present or heard, of course, about the Momentos event that we had a couple days ago where uh, 22 countries publicly and very forcefully declared their, their support for nuclear uh, energy and their interest in achieving an ambition of tripling nuclear energy by 2050. So I think that with that goal in mind, this report certainly is going to be very instrumental. So let me stop right here to invite uh, the next speaker that is going to kick off this session. So it is now my pleasure to invite uh, Sebastian Burduja, who is uh, the ambassador that is going to of, of uh, Romania that is going to make the, the initial remarks. Uh, Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to be here for this uh, wonderful occasion. I'm not the ambassador of Romania, I'm the Minister of Energy, unfortunately. I think my job would be slightly easier if uh, I was ambassador. But anyway, um, 
I'm very grateful, and I'm grateful that uh, nuclear is so high on the agenda here at COP28. And I want to thank our hosts and you all for raising the profile. I look at my good friend Cosmin Gitsa sitting there in the back. He's the CEO of our uh, national nuclear company, Nuclear Electrica, one of the leaders in the field. And uh, he's always opening up bottles of champagne because of the revival of the nuclear sector. And uh, that was not the case only a few years ago. So I uh, remembered uh, just a few days ago when I um, spoke at the tripling nuclear capacity event by 2050 uh, that uh, it's been 70 years since the Atoms for Peace speech on December 8th of this year. And I hope we will mark that day as well. And uh, it, it did seem that nuclear was the big promise back then. And it seems that it is the big promise now. So I'm uh, more than pleased as a representative of a country that has betted on nuclear for many years. And that's a story in of itself. Uh, back in the 70s, Romania was obviously behind the Iron Curtain, unfortunately. Uh, we were a communist country back then. Uh, but that government had uh, the wisdom to choose Western technology for our nuclear program which is absolutely unique in our whole region. If you look at all our neighbors, they all still depend on Russian uh, uranium fuel, on Russian technology, on Russian engineers sometimes. Not our case. We have knocked on Canada's door back then, and today we have two of the best performing reactors in the world uh, on CANDU technology. And we still have pretty much an integrated nuclear cycle from uh, uranium mining to heavy water production, the production of nuclear fuel, and of course, uh, nuclear energy. So uh, just a few key points that I'd like to highlight, and I went through your output. It's wonderful. I think it's exactly what's needed at this point. I think the first and most important one is to be very clear and explain the technologies, especially new ones. So you talked about public engagement. I think that's absolutely vital. Uh, you might know we, are, we have embarked on a race to develop one of the first SMRs in the world, maybe the first. And we have chosen the New Scale technology. And you all may know that New Scale has recently gone through a more delicate uh, moment. And the Idaho project had to be canceled for commercial reasons. And we fully understand among experts and policymakers that it was nothing related to the technology itself. But moments like that are exploited by those who do not serve our interests or the interests of the Western world to say that, uh, you know, we can be guinea pigs of some new technology that uh, is not good enough for the host country. So we need to carefully manage those messages and have a better effort at explaining for everybody's understanding, the promise, the safety, uh, the reliability of these technologies as they have been vetted along the decades. So I hope that uh, we can all join in that effort. At least for, for my people, that would be tremendously important. Also, uh, you point out the, the relevance of research and development. And before being Minister of Energy, I was Minister of Research, Innovation, and Digitalization back in my country. And we have... Uh, started a very important fourth generation demonstrator, uh, a fast reactor that is uh, cooled through lead technology. And that's going well, and I just want to highlight it's one of the very few research projects at the European level that benefit from European grants. It's very hard to get EU money for nuclear projects. And again, that's something to think about, because if we don't have the funding for these projects, we're not really going to be able to triple our capacity by 2050. I think it's going to be extremely hard. Then I think you rightly point out the role of, uh, our, of, of uh, developing expertise and training the next generation of experts that will run these things. And I'm proud to note that we already have in Romania a simulator of a command room of an SMR. Uh, it's operating at the most prestigious uh, school. I think it's rightly called the Romanian MIT. Uh, I don't know if it's as good as MIT. Maybe it's even better sometimes. Who knows? Uh, but certainly it's functional and it's training already generations of young people that are learning how these things will work. And we're more than happy to replicate that around the region or in any other country that's interested. The Polytechnic University is very happy to promote uh, that example. And last but not least, uh, you know, the Hungarian uh, foreign minister, uh, Mr. Siarto, was in Bucharest uh, not long ago. 
uh, and uh, he's a character. Uh, so he, he made an argument of why uh, Hungary still much depends on Russia for its energy, and he said, we have to take politics out of energy. And I said, we can take politics out of energy, but we can't take geopolitics out of energy. So I think in, as we develop our uh, nuclear plans, all of us, and I think we all agree that there's no path to net zero without nuclear, I think it's important uh, where we put our bets, where around the globe we put that finger on the map. And as the example of Romania proves from 50 years ago, uh, the consequences can be long term. So I urge you to consider that. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to uh, welcome somebody I deeply admire, uh, Secretary Ernie Muniz. I think you've uh, very eloquently noted in the past the role of energy for the economy, and I very much look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Minister, and um, I won't take the bait on the MIT uh, uh, comparisons, uh, but, uh, but I will uh, say that uh, the technology you referred to, um, uh, it, it, yeah, was th that's not the problem. The problem was some utility structures in our country, and so uh, let's keep working on these, on these new technologies uh, going, going forward. Um, uh, we really appreciate uh, all the work that uh, Romania does in this uh, in this domain, uh, and um, maybe we can do some more uh, together on that. Uh, also, of course, want to thank uh, Madam uh, Director General. Um, I've, uh, there she is, back back there, uh, uh, working with the uh, WNA, and of course the IAEA. Uh, first of all, hosting us here, but uh, a tremendous partner uh, in so many ways. Uh, in safety and security, uh, in promoting uh, nuclear energy. Uh, and I just have to say that uh, the Director General Grossi in particular, I have the highest admiration for uh, the leadership he is showing, uh, particularly in the very difficult situation in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, I think we have just great partners here, and the panel will we'll, we'll hold for, uh, for, uh, for later. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, we've already heard, and but it bears repeating. Saturday, uh, we had that uh, remarkable event uh, in which, uh, as we heard, 22 countries came forward uh, to talk about the need, the absolute need, for worldwide tripling of nuclear power. I do want to emphasize that one of the remarkable points of that event was that it happened at all, uh, that uh, nuclear power has taken such a uh, prominent role in the discussions here at COP28 is really uh, quite, uh, quite novel. And I want to congratulate our uh, Emirati uh, hosts uh, because uh, I think to be clear, we would never have seen the prominence of nuclear energy at this, uh, at this COP if it were not for the Emiratis and ENEC walking in the talk. They did it. They built a program uh, in a remarkably short time successfully, drawing upon every international collaboration that was viewed as helpful to the project. It was about the project and getting it done, and I think that's the foundation uh, on which we have been able to uh, not even fin not finish yet, but start a number of uh, uh, focused events on, uh, on on nuclear energy. Uh, the urgency, uh, as the my one bullet on the screen uh, notes, uh, of course, the urgency uh, is driven uh, by the need to catch up uh, in terms of addressing climate. Um, uh, the, the the stock take the global stock take. Uh, has pretty uh, clearly uh, indicated uh, uh, the shortcomings in the pace and scale uh, of our efforts. And uh, tripling, uh, I know Armand would, would like to increase the size of that digit uh, beyond three, but um, let's start with tripling uh, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by 2050 is important. In saying that we would triple, you know, we're talking the better part of a terawatt of nuclear power addition 
with that challenge. Uh, that's going to be also a challenge to meet that. We're going to have to see contributions across the entire spectrum uh, of countries uh, uh, in, on this globe. Uh, that includes, for sure, the embarking countries, those countries that have announced uh, uh, intent, announced goals uh, to develop nuclear power but do not yet have programs. Uh, they are not, they are by no means the only ones uh, in, this, uh, in this effort by, by far. Uh, I would say, by the way, in the United States, after a long hiatus, we finally got one new power plant uh, operating. A uh, little controversy, but let me tell you, it is operating beautifully. Uh, it just cranks out electrons uh, uh, all the time. Uh, uh, and uh, those who are benefiting from it, from that, are actually quite thankful at this stage that despite all the challenges, that that, 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 that is happening. Uh, anyway, to go back to, this, to the, the main theme, uh, uh, I would posit that success in tripling will require significant contributions from embarking countries uh, uh, in addition to others. And it is incumbent on us, and it is the motivation behind the playbook that my colleague uh, will be discussing in detail, uh, it is incumbent that cooperation, collaboration, uh, support for embarking countries who are entering new territory, hopefully to be as successful as the Emiratis have been over the last uh, 15 years, rough, uh, roughly, uh, that it is in all of our interests to help with that. And therefore, the, the playbook that we will discuss, done through a, a collaboration of the Clean Air Task Force, uh, Energy Futures Initiative, and Nuclear Threat Initiative, as was said earlier, uh, that um, uh, that collaboration is looking to spell out what are the key points and what are the options fit to purpose for different countries to be able to have that kind of success that we talked about. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Armin Cohen. Um, who heads the Clean Air Task Force uh, to actually take us through the, um, uh, the playbook. Cerny, uh, I have the pleasure of trying to summarize a 60-page report in 10 minutes or less, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fast. Um, but uh, uh, just to, be, to pick up where Ernie left off, why now, why this report, uh, what's different? I can't say that all the ideas in, in this report are completely novel. Um, it was truly a collaboration, but uh, it's, as, as Ernie said, it, it is the moment. Just to put some numbers on what Ernie said. Uh, so, you know, the tripling is about 1.2 terawatts. That's about 47 gigawatts a year, every year between now and 2050. And, you know, that's not totally out of reach. Uh, the, the world did dip, uh, create about 30 gigawatts per year at the peak build. So we're kind of could get back into that neighborhood, but we know that we're not there, and that's because the current model just doesn't scale. Uh, and we'll go into that, reasons for that in a minute, and talk about some of the remedies. Um, so what this playbook does is offer a comprehensive approach. Um, we are focusing on six pillars in this report. Uh, just very briefly, it's improving project execution so that we really can get to that sort of 50 gigawatt per year range, um, changing the regulatory system, uh, making projects bankable and financeable, um, attending to nuclear nonproliferation concerns and security, uh, dealing with the spent nuclear fuel problem and workforce development. Seems like a long list. We try and break it down into pieces so that um, it's digestible and we can think about how to move forward. Let's start with project execution. And the first three pillars, project execution um, and uh, the other items, are really, uh, you could say they're, they're about the commercial ecosystem in a way. So what's wrong? But here's the status quo. We have very complex projects, uh, really mega projects, infrastructure projects that are, are very complicated, take a long time, uh, and uh, with long time frames, we've had high costs, uh, perhaps with a couple of exceptions. Uh, the Emiratis have shown us how to do it right, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, uh, and China, of course, is moving very quickly. But for the most part, uh, we've been very, very mired in, in a very long lead time, kind of high cost world. And finally, uh, because of the hiatus of the last 30 years of, of the world building, we have limited experience and infrastructure to do this. 
So what's, uh, and, and also we have kind of a, uh, a hodgepodge of, of organizations, EPCs, vendors, utilities, off-takers, um, all kind of trying to make this work. And there's really no organization uh, to integrate this development. So these are all serious barriers. So what the report suggests is that there, there actually are some ways forward on project execution. Uh, the key actions that the report highlight are first moving from a project-based approach to what we call a product-based approach, uh, which is something that's standardized, that's, that's replicable, that's mass-produced. Um, that requires a large order book. Uh, I know that other people have talked about this, but it's a, it's a really important point. Unless you get scale, like South Korea did, or like uh, uh, France did, or Canada, you're not going to get down that cost curve. So repeatability, standardized uh, units is very important on a very large order book. Um, the specific proposed initiatives in the report are uh, creating or imagining an integrated uh, development organization or organizations that could bring together the different parts of the value chain um, and unify the risk of these projects rather than having people point fingers at each other. When, when things go wrong, there should be a single address. Um, and then very importantly, the order book and, and, the, and efforts to d uh, aggregate demand to get to that learning scale. Um, the regulatory system obviously is, is critical to this. You have to have confidence. But we, ha we, we talk about a couple of very specific things. Um, one is that particularly for embarking countries um, uh, that don't have native capability or experience with, with licensing nuclear, there needs to be some sort of technical support. Now, I could, I could uh, sort of summarize this by saying we need to do what the United Emirates did, but we need to do it many, many times over. And we came up with the idea of a, an international technical support organization that would uh, essentially provide that kind of expertise to assist embarking countries moving up that learning scale very quickly for, for regulatory capability. Finally, we float the idea of a globally acceptable design acceptance certificate. One of the problems, of course, with any design is that it has to go through, in theory, 193 <laughs> separate licensing processes, which is not very, uh, uh, you know, encouraging. Uh, we, we looked at the aviation playbook and said, you know, there, there may be a way to accelerate this through common design review. Um, there's an even more aggressive proposal uh, in there for a global licensing authority. We'll leave that for another day. Um, third uh, major pillar of the report is what we call project bankability and finance. We won't go into great detail, but, but we, we break this down into three parts. One is minimizing and containing the capital costs, and a lot of what I just talked about goes to that, unified project management, replicability, et cetera, um, co uh, a focus on cost, design for manufacturing and cost. Uh, the second is man minimizing the cost of capital, and we have several recommendations around that, including most aggressively the creation of an international bank for nuclear infrastructure, which was not our idea. Other people are working on that. But, but there are various other ways that we can kind of help de-risk and reduce the cost of capital. And then finally, supporting an adequate revenue model. This is, these, this is gonna have to be country by country, but there has to be uh, a line of sight, there has to be a certainty of, of cost recovery, and we have several uh, proposals along those lines. Um, th I'm going to go to that. Those are the commercial pillars. They all work together. Um, if you have a, a sort of replicable, you know, product-based model, standardized model, that may make it easier to license and regulate. In turn, if you have, uh, if you have a good uh, international harmonization of regulation, it'll be easier to get that order book and scale. Uh, and, of course, that every makes everything more bankable. So those three parts are, uh, those first three pillars are quite related. And, and synergistic. Um, the last three pillars deal with what we more say traditional public policy issues around nuclear, um, nuclear non-proficient security. Um, the basic message is we have a system in place that works well and uh, that, that we would, uh, the, the report leans more in the direction of saying stick with the ones through fuel cycle based on LWRs and LEU fuel. Innovation is good, but for the next 10 or 20 years, um, that's a proven pathway uh, from, a, from an, 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 a set of institutions that know how to manage that process. Rely on an international market for fuel. Um, incorporate your security planning early in the process, not midway. And on the, the, the sensitive question of, of safeguards and old standards and things like that, we take a pragmatic approach, which is we do have a, a, a group of international norms. Let's build, uh, let's make sure that everyone's at least in compliance with that and then exceed um, those standards uh, on a bespoke and, and appropriate basis. Spent nuclear fuel is obviously a, a looming issue everywhere, but um, uh, our strong premise is that all reactors and fuel cycles will require a permanent 
waste repository, whether you're doing recycling or not. So let's just face up to that fact. Um, recognize that interim storage uh, is going to be an important consideration for near-term expansion. Um, obviously, this is a problem that we know can be managed safely, securely, and economically. Uh, I don't want to say it's just a political problem. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated political economic problem. But uh, nonetheless, we believe that, uh, that, that there is a pathway forward. And uh, we do um, uh, take the view that direct disposal would simplify spent fuel management. Finally, workforce development. Um, as I said, the, the workforce is depleted. It's, it's not in great shape because of this 30-year hiatus in the world in, in, in building. So uh, we clearly, um, it's a crucial resource, but we have limited expertise right now. So the approaches recommended in the report are, first of all, for countries to start with a domestic workforce assessment, see what you've got, see what you can, you can borrow, uh, regional partnerships to transfer uh, expertise, talent exchanges, you know, for example, embedding um, uh, embedding uh, folks from embarking countries in the new builds that are occurring elsewhere in the world can be a way of accelerating the learning. And uh, our specific proposed initiative, again, is, is a technical support organization in this space. I'll just conclude by, uh, with a couple of observations uh, wrapping up. Um, these are very ambitious uh, objectives, you might even say aspirational, um, but progress can begin today. We don't need the whole kit and caboodle. Um, but, uh, but new international institutions, we believe, will eventually be needed. So let's start down these directions, and there are lighter versions of what we suggested that can be done through multilateral uh, conversations and, and work. One size doesn't fit all. That list, we think, is generally the checkbox, but how it's implemented is obviously going to be dependent on, on various countries' situations. Um, this, this report is dedicated to um, uh, embarking countries, but it's no secret that <laughs> The, uh, the, the, the folks, the 30-ish countries that already have nuclear could certainly benefit from some of these institutions as well. Um, and uh, uh, we don't explicitly address the role of public opinion and public support. That's obviously a foundational issue. We say a little bit about that in the report. I would personally take the view that the nuclear public opinion situation is much better than it was, uh, say, 10 years ago. The problem still is delivery, um, and that's what we address. One last comment uh, that uh, this report does not talk about new versus old technologies, as Ernest suggested. We think that technology can help things, but it's not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is the ecosystem issues that we identify in the report. So with that, Diana, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Thank you very much. My microphone, there we go. Uh, thank you, uh, Armand. Thank you, Secretary Moniz uh, and uh, Dr. Bilbao Leon uh, for the excellent uh, introductory presentations. I'm Deanne Cameron. I'm the head of nuclear, develop nuclear technology development and economics at the Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, and it's my real pleasure to be here today uh, to moderate a discussion about the playbook that, uh, that you are launching today uh, and the concepts uh, that are contained in it and to invite um, uh, these distinguished panelists uh, to share their perspectives from uh, their experiences and their aspirations and plans for nuclear uh, in their national contexts. Uh, the, the timeliness of this is really important. Um, COP 28 has put nuclear and an aspiration to triple global installed nuclear capacity by 2050 sort of center stage. Uh, we at the Nuclear Energy Agency um, have done the analysis and published in 2022 uh, uh, the, the evidence that shows that the world needs to triple global installed nuclear capacity by 2050 to achieve net zero. And we demonstrate uh, how one might do that. And it is through a combination of refurbishment and life extension of the existing fleet, the build out of new large scale reactors, likely based on existing technologies, and also the introduction and the build out of small modular reactors for a combination of electricity and heat. But that all of this needs to happen in a fashion that is integrated with variable renewables and with hydro. Uh, so it is really not a question, in order to triple, it is not a question of SMRs versus large scale. It's not a question of new versus long-term operation. And it's certainly not a question of nuclear versus renewables. We need all of the above. And uh, Armand, I really like the phrase that you use, the current model doesn't scale. 
Um, it is clear that the level of ambition that has been set out for us here at COP28 to triple by 2050 um, means that this is the time for big thinking and it is the time to raise big strategic questions. Um, how do we unlock the speed and the scale necessary? Uh, you've set out for us six areas uh, to consider and in those six areas you've proposed the creation of several, I would say, very ambitious um, new inter international institutions uh, and almost as though in this playbook you're calling for a new Bretton Woods moment, the creation of a new multilateral development bank for nuclear, an international technical standards organization, uh, development integration organizations, um, uh, and there's one more in my notes, I can't find it, but these are really big ideas and I think the time is right to be asking these really big ideas. Maybe just one last uh, uh, point about the, the momentum that we see. It's actually not just here at COP. We see the momentum building outside and around COP. In September at the NEA, we convened a ministerial meeting where 20 ministers and 40 CEOs signed declarations and were building their momentum towards COP28. And we know that in March, leaders will meet in Brussels. So it really is, uh, it's not just here at COP, uh, it's building up to and following from COP. So now I'd like to uh, introduce my, my distinguished panelists here with me today. Mohamed al Breki, CEO of ENEC Consulting and Director of Strategy at ENEC. Um, I have directly to my left, Rowena Tolentino, who is Head Executive Assistant at the Ministry of Energy in the Philippines. And at the end of uh, the row, Herbert Crepa, Deputy Minister of Energy in Ghana. I'd like to start with a question for uh, Mohammed al -Braiki. Um Please, first, I'd just like to invite your views on the playbook that we've just heard about. Um, uh, are there any, uh, what is your reaction? Is this the right time? Are the ideas, uh, are they the right ideas? Are they the right priorities? And what's the feasibility of achieving what the playbook recommends to us? Um, yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Diana. Welcome to Dubai, welcome to the UAE. Um, uh, second, yes, my uh, I've been in the business with Inec for the last 13 years, so I've been blessed and lucky enough to see how the company grew and the different through the different strategies and the different milestones. Uh, my first reaction of the playbook was a uh, really great initiative, and I like the name of it, the playbook. It's 60 pages report that shows you from different segments how would you start your nuclear uh, journey from a project execution, regulatory framework, how to make it bankable, the different stakeholders, well, they cover it in a very hol uh, holistic way. How would you embark on uh, this and give you that starting point that then every country or any newcomer would need to strategize, put their uh, roadmaps in and, and, and build, build on those expertise. But very great initiatives at a great time. Right now, especially we're trying to tripling nuclear uh, two days ago, we signed, we got the declaration signed by many governments, which was really positive. And I think it's doable, really, to tripling nuclear by 2050. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question of you, specifically on workforce, um, because you have done such a tremendous job here in the UAE. What are the key lessons learned on workforce development and the best practices from your experience and successes with Baraka? How should the global nuclear sector approach the challenge of growing the talent pipeline with the speed and the quality that is needed to triple global installed nuclear capacity in 26 years, which is the time we have till 2050? Great, great question and great challenge too. Uh, at the same time, what I wanted to start with is the beginning. There are different pillars that made this program a success. Uh, number one being leadership and the government support. Uh, number two would be putting the right policy in place. Uh, that policy is a public uh, paper, it's online, you could uh, Google it, is the UAE Civil Nuclear Policy, which uh, committing us to the highest standards of safety, security, and non-proliferation. And then putting the right strategies through the right time with the right workforce. So on, back in Baraka nuclear power plants at uh, Emirates Nuclear Energy, we have over 50 nationalities. And all those 50 nationalities, we agreed that we're gonna do it the Baraka way. 
not anybody's way. We're going to do it the Baraka way, the way it's going to suit uh, United Arab Emirates environment, how to build those plans. And delivering mega projects within the country hasn't been very uh, something that is uh, unique. We've been delivering a lot of mega projects, something we're really proud of. Um, however, focus back to your question, focusing on the workforce, throughout the time we've been really investing in our workforce, getting the right subject matter experts from the different, uh, different nationalities, the different expertise, through the different timelines of the program. And we've been investing on training uh, those individuals. We've been investing in from the schools also. We've been looking at a lot of different schools and let them learn about nuclear energy. At the same time, establishing different pipelines. Sometimes you need higher SROs, for example, the senior reactor operators. You need to get them licensed. You need to get them prepared, trained. And they've been training in different countries, too. There a lot of them have been training in the US, a lot of them training in different countries in operating plants by itself. So what really helped, strategically speaking, is starting with the workforce development and strategizing and investing in our people early on, early on, and starting that journey and focusing on getting operational ready early on, because we know we're going to get there. So establishing that uh, investment from the beginning really helped us when we wanted to. Uh, operate those plants and right now also we're uh, like our plants right now about it has about 21 percent of the females and this is a very high percentage compared to many nuclear plants and the shift supervisor on unit two is a local female there's something really we're really uh, proud of to see local ue citizens operating such plants in a new, uh, the first Arab country operating nuclear power plants at that large scale. There is one point I'd like to mention on Arnold's uh, speech on the uh, going up to scale. Uh, managing mega projects, especially nuclear plants, when you put the first one up and you're getting all your lessons learned and, 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 and execute them in unit two and then unit three and then unit four, that learning rate is massive. That learning rate is very, very big. I can give you an example. Now, from a breaker to breaker, when we pour concrete for the unit until we load the fuel, we call this in the industry a breaker to breaker. There was a 39% improvement of time from unit three compared to unit one. So that learning rate is something that all of us as an industry that we could capitalize on. And this is how we can triple nuclear by 2050. It is doable, and it is uh, uh, the clean base load that the world needs is, is, is uh, that abundance also does not come without nuclear energy. So it's uh, been lovely, uh, and we're continuing that journey through different growth initiatives that I can talk about later on. The, the, thank you so much. Um, those are very insightful comments and what a remarkable learning curve, 39% from unit one to unit two. Um, that really speaks to the need for a programmatic approach, for a fleet-based approach, if not a product-based approach. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Ms. Rowena Tolentino. First, to invite your reactions and feedback on the playbook overall, uh, including your views on were there any particular elements that were very important to you and uh, your perspective from the Philippines? Well, good after, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for organizing this. And thank, um, and I think um, the issuance of the of this playbook is very timely and strategic, and and it, it is a strategic resource for embarking countries. It will simplify the process on um, deploying nuclear technology in our countries, in our country, and um, in particular. Um, given that at the current stage we are developing the regulatory framework in the Philippines, the, that portion in the playbook would be very helpful in, uh, to the Philippines in ensuring that um, the appropriate um, legal framework that would ensure the highest, highest standards for security, safety, and safeguards will be in place. And of course, given that um, one of the priorities is we provide a clean source of energy to uh, ensure stability of supply 
at the same time ensure affordability. So the portion on um, um, financing and bank bankability of the projects would be uh, very helpful in ensuring that the projects that we will be undertaken in the future in our country would um, work towards the primary goal of um, providing affordable and clean energy to the Filipino people. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, many of us have uh, have, have dreamed of regulatory harmonization on a global scale. It's, uh, it's, a, noble, uh, it's a noble end goal, uh, but has proved to be very difficult to make progress towards. But there is an, uh, a part of the playbook that talks about uh, shared assessments, technical assessments. Uh, and so that might be a really great stepping stone. And, and I think uh, resonates with, with what you've just said on the importance of um, being able to stand up credible regulatory framework um, uh, from the get-go. Uh, let me turn now, if I could ask you a little bit more on the financing recommendations. So here at COP28, uh, there have been calls, including by ministers and leaders on Saturday in the, in the declaration uh, that calls for a tripling of nuclear. There is a call out to multilateral development banks and the World Bank. Uh, to play a role in helping to finance uh, nuclear energy projects in, a, in developing countries. But the playbook today also showcases efforts and uh, supports the proposal to create a new multilateral development bank called the International Bank for Nuclear Infrastructure, or IBNI. Um, what do you make of these two proposals, the call on the World Bank and the call to create a new bank? Do you see them as alternatives? Uh, do you see them as complementary? I think, um, again, I want to emphasize the ultimate goal of providing affordable energy. So any alternatives that will work towards minimizing cost of construction of nuclear energy or a nuclear power plant in the country is very much welcome. And we recognize that there's constraint in financing at this time. And if these two initiatives will help um, ensure a steady flow of financing for nuclear projects, especially for embarking countries, this is a welcome development. And um, we are looking forward on, on the progress, on the attainment of this um, objective for um, attaining, of course, the international um, goal of increasing deployment of nuclear technology in the energy systems of many countries. Maybe one very quick follow-up to, to what you've said, because um, I think this is a really important point. Um, in, a, in a round table discussion about this playbook, uh, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, we heard a representative from the World Bank suggest that embarking developing countries that want to pursue nuclear energy would prefer bilateral finance from the exporting countries and do not uh, uh, and are not requesting multilateral development finance for their projects. Um, does that ring true to you or are, am I hearing correctly that you're saying no, all of these options are important? Yes, the latter part is correct. Um, all options are, we are, we welcome all options, meaning we are not limiting ourselves to available options at this point. If we can, do, if we can provide more alternatives to embarking countries that could reduce capital costs, that would increase access to financing, we will support those initiatives to ensure that we are aligned with our commitment to provide affordable and clean energy to the energy consumers. Thank you. I think that's very important for us to be hearing directly from uh, embarking countries. Uh, now I'd like to turn to our third panelists, uh, Herbert Crepa. First, the same opening question. Just your reactions to the playbook. Uh, do you welcome this at this moment in time? It has these six pillars. Do any of the pillars ring especially important to you uh, for Ghana? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I should also uh, thank the organizers, the IAEA and um, all the other institutions that have put this together. And also thank our hosts uh, for uh, a brilliant organization of this COP and also uh, putting nuclear as part of the, the big agendas. I, I think it's quite obvious to everybody that um, 
a lot of little pieces are coming together positively for the nuclear agenda. Um, and that, for me, means that one of the biggest takeaways of this playbook is the timing. I think they, they, the IAEA and the institutions that, that have developed this playbook have taken advantage of the momentum that is building positively in favor of nuclear. Uh, and I, th I think you, you, you really deserve to be commended for that. Uh, for us, uh, you know, uh, countries who are uh, really new to the, to the nuclear conversation and are emerging uh, into the nuclear conversation, this playbook would be useful. Um, uh, a few takeaways include the, the question of how to deal with the cost, uh, the capital cost and the, and the revenue uh, recovery. I think uh, looking into the detail of the various um, proposals and the various methods that have been proposed to achieve that, I think will be very useful, especially in a time when you know, many economies are, are still grappling with the aftermath and the after effect of some of the, you know, the consequences of geopolitics and all the, uh, the issues that economies are, are, are facing today. Uh, I think also a unified, sort of harmonized, globalized um, um, certification system, I think helps with the confidence. Um, and I think that's also a significant takeaway uh, from from the the playbook, fuel disposal is also a matter uh, that continues to concern you know imagine uh, countries, and so I think that's another another point to take away. And probably the the public opinion question: how we continue to build positive public opinion to support the agenda? Because clearly, uh, we're not going to be able to meet the ambitions of. Uh, emissions reductions by half century without nuclear. I think that's become non-debatable by now. And so uh, how we rally around uh, to ensure that we carry our people along the science and the finance, I think is, is crucial. And then probably finally, um, um, the, the idea that one size does not fit all. It's also very assuring and reassuring. And I, I think that's another positive takeaway that, that I see from though because we have to be be uh, honest with ourselves that what's worked uh, uh, in one jurisdiction may not necessarily work directly in, in another one in my country and how we are able to modify and um, get it adapted into our own jurisdiction for our own purposes in line with the vision that we have for building prosperity for our people in a clean way is, is what will work for us. So those will be my, my, my takeaways from from, from the playbook, save that we, we are yet to, to get a copy to digest it properly and see how we use it in our home country. Thank you for your feedback. I think that's very, uh, very insightful, very helpful feedback that helps contextualize the report in, uh, in, the, in the real lived experience of, uh, of embarking countries. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question of you um, on this concept of uh, uh, an order book or uh, durable demand signal is, I think, some of the language that is used in uh, in the playbook. Um, the the key message, as I understand it from the playbook, is that um, one of the ways that we need to act to drive down the overall costs of new nuclear is to be creating a demand signal for multiple projects, for a fleet of projects, for a programmatic build out. Um, because when we have an order book only for one project at a time, it doesn't create that demand signal to the talent pipeline, to the supply chain, uh, or to, to any of the institutions actually. So um, what would be needed to enable this approach of creating demand for a fleet in a country like Ghana? Could you do that unilaterally or do you see the need to work uh, with other nations uh, uh, on planning of a fleet, creating that demand signal? Is it more of a regional uh, perspective that you bring to this? Uh, I just really would welcome your views on this idea. I think the, the, the idea of um, an order book, I, I think um, for, for us, you know, embarking countries, I, I think demand aggregation would be crucial for, for an order book. And perhaps 
and these will be, you know, initial uh, comments uh, because a more detailed thinking has to go into it. But perhaps a regional approach would be prudent for, for taking an order uh, book demand aggregation position because then that helps to, to bring, you know, align member states who, who share the vision uh, to come on board the, the program and then we can create one uh, uh, capacity, one uh, sort of centralized nu nuclear program, not have to duplicate uh, a lot more of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the programs and then save cost, drive down the cost and then also the assurance of the technology. But I think that would work um, if the member states uh, are aligned in terms of getting the initial work out of the way. We in Ghana have done significant amount of the preparatory work. We have a regulatory authority that has been in place, backed by an act of parliament since 2015. We have a nuclear power Ghana, which is the, if you like, the operator owner, uh, whose chief executive is, is sitting right here in the room, um, providing me support, albeit from very far away. Um, and so we've done that work. The IAEA has certified that work, believes that we have done significant work to go into uh, uh, developing a program. We are out there in the market trying to find a vendor uh, to, to partner with for the development of our, our nuclear power program. And so that regional approach would work. Uh, I know that countries such as Senegal and, and a few others are also getting into the, you know, the process. It will work if we're able to align in terms of ambitions and agree in terms of scope and approach, then that order book ap approach would, would be useful. And I, and I think the, uh, the, the summit that was held in Accra, uh, I believe would have helped uh, in many ways in that regard, uh, in the area of the leadership uh, that is required to bring um, other member states on board, and also the confidence uh, of the finance and the science uh, to ensure that other member states are, are coming on board the nuclear program. We must admit uh, that uh, not all countries have embraced the nuclear question uh, with the same momentum. Uh, they, they, there are different you know, levels of appreciation, understanding, and acceptability of the nuclear program. And the more we're able to build um, that regional support from starting from uh, those member states who are who be who are ready and believe in the in the in the in the program, then we can have that uh, effect on other member states. So I would go for a more regional approach for the the order book and the the demand aggregation approach for all the the cost benefits that, that, that can help with. Um, but as I say, it is um, very um, early in the day for us in terms of that, you know, thinking. And if we're able to, you know, bring more technical capacity into the conversation in, in, in these uh, countries, I believe that we, we should be able to find the right pathway uh, for, 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 for the, the program. There's no doubt at all uh, whether we believe that we should, we should do this in Ghana. There's no doubt at all. When we launched our energy transition framework, um, our president made it clear that nuclear is going to serve as the base load. So we are not in any doubt at all. Uh, we believe that it will provide uh, easily one of the biggest assurances of green energy production um, to protect the climate to assure our ethical responsibility for as global, you know, partakers and what is going on. Uh, but the, the, the work has to be done rather neatly um, and, and the public has to be brought on board with us. And that's why I think this playbook will be useful for our purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running up against the clock, so I'm going to close with one final question each, uh, and so maybe less than one minute each. Let me start with you, uh, Herbert. Um, Ghana hosted the 
International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, IFNEC, ministerial meeting last month. So we had a ministerial meeting in September in Paris, then there was a ministerial meeting in Ghana. We're here at COP, where ministers and leaders are talking about tripling nuclear. We're headed into March in Brussels. There's clearly this momentum. What were the big outcomes from your ministerial meeting in Ghana, and do they align with these other discussions, our discussion here today about the playbook, but the discussions at COP? I think they do. They align on both fronts, the, the, the discussions in the playbook and the discussions here at COP. Uh, but member states, the countries that were present in this uh, meeting, the ministers who were there, uh, were quite clear about the need for the, the science, you know, the assurance of the science. They were quite clear that uh, the, the technology um, has to be spot on. The technology assurance needs to be, you know, convincing. Uh, the cost as well uh, was also a matter that uh, you know, uh, member states were, were were very interested in, and capacity. Um, you know how to build capacity on the continent, uh, so that operators come in and help to develop, and then uh, you know the the the, the locals uh, can engineers can take over and run the program. So those were some of the concerns. Um, and I see that they are very much aligned with the, 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 the outcomes or, or the recommendations of your playbook. Um, but the leadership is important. Um, the, the, the leadership that we see currently uh, is crucial to drive the nuclear um, program, to convince member states to come on board uh, so that the, the nuclear agenda can, can succeed. Thank you, and I hope that we see continued regional discussions and ministerial meetings uh, in, in Ghana and in Africa. Thank you for that. Uh, final question for Rowena, and then I'll close with our UAE hosts. Um, please, uh, tell us a little bit, you know, in, in very shortly, uh, short amount of time, the level of ambition for new nuclear in the Philippines. Okay, um, so currently we are awaiting for the enactment of regulatory framework from the legislative branch of the government. And part of our initial milestones for our nuclear energy program is the updating of our um, nuclear roadmap, as well as the inclusion of nuclear energy in our Philippine energy plan. And this updated Philippine energy plan which will cover 2023 to 2050, will now include nuclear energy. And we are targeting to have at least around 4,800 megawatts by 2050 um, for this, um, to attain, of course, our climate targets and to ensure that we are providing stable, reliable, and clean, and of course, affordable energy to uh, the Filipino consumers. Terrific. Thank you so much. And now the final question for uh, Mohammed. Uh, and let's end on a real positive note here. What do you believe the top three reasons were that Baraka was so successful? And maybe a little bit of a twist on that question. If the new institutions that are proposed in the playbook, these new multilateral institutions for project or organization, for development finance, uh, for technical standards support, if they had existed 15 years ago, would Baraka have been completed even faster and more efficiently? Good question. Um, so from the first question, what I think what made Baraka success is, first of all, is leadership and leadership support. Uh, second of all is the, the workforce that we've been hiring and uh, the SMEs that we have at the right time uh, that we had throughout the whole program. Um, and also the commitment from the country to have that critical infrastructure base load to be uh, up and running and operating in a very safe and uh, secured manner. So a lot of factors helped our program uh, putting that financial bankability deal together, the governance that we have uh, between ourselves and our partners, and also the, uh, the different uh, standards that we put for ourselves. And you know, our boss, Mohammed Al Hamadi, he would always raise the bar uh, time on a time, and this is how we kind of stumble on our journey for excellence, 
And that's uh, non-stopping. We're going to continue doing that for sure. Now, uh, have all these initiatives been there from uh, 15 years ago? Will we deliver Baraka faster? I think yes. There are a lot of initiatives happening, also from the regulatory side with the IEA uh, on, on uh, regulatory harmonization. That would help a lot. A lot of nations, a lot of nations, when they get into this uh, harmonization of regulatory framework, and imagine if the same thing happens with design. This is why if we scale up nuclear, things could happen faster and it will cost less to, uh, to get those nuclear plants built and operating in a very safely manner. And the one thing I want to conclude with is the theme of this COP is to unite, act, and deliver. And I think the playbook gets us all together here so we're all united now within one COP so we could take an action and act and put some real steps, concrete steps towards our journey and deliver those nuclear plants for, to get to our net zero. I mean, those four plants that we have now in Baraka, they're, they're, they're major accelerator to our net zero. So about 25%, they're covering 25% of the energy demand at the same time, 25% of uh, the country's NDCs, the, na uh, the national deterministic contribution. It's a, it's a very clean, reliable base load to the grid that help us decarbonize our different sectors that here in the country. So let's unite, act, and deliver together. That sounds great. So please join me in thanking our panelists and in inviting Secretary Moniz uh, back up to the podium to deliver closing remarks. Yeah, I think this was a terrific panel, and we appreciate the, all the insights. And Diane, thanks for uh, guiding that uh, guiding that discussion. Um, I would just conclude by saying that uh, I think I can speak for all of our group that we feel better now than we did before this event uh, in in terms of the playbook. Uh, hopefully, having some real utility, uh, and um, uh, and we'd like to follow that up. And of course, our in a host institution, IAEA, uh, the WNA, the NEA, um, uh, these are all critical institutions. And let's take that last charge, Unite, Act, Deliver, to work together on the delivering part uh, because uh, we've got a ways to go. Uh, we've got a terawatt to go uh, in the next, uh, the next quarter century. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this has been very helpful to us, and uh, we certainly volunteer to be as helpful to you as you will find useful. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>